you're raising your your kids here. What what's your policy on letting them out? Man, it's slippery. How how old is your oldest? Uh, well, I have a, a grown one who's 22, and then I have a, a 10 and an 8. Okay. And it's hard, man, because I don't even like when they go over on sleepovers over Why a friend's not? house. Because it's scary. Whose problem is that? It's everybody's problem. You know, it's, uh, well, I mean, the parents, I mean, we're, we're pretty selective about the parents, but there's a lot of parents that don't pay attention to their kids at all. Meaning they just tune out and they get on the phone. And the kids are sticking mm-hmm. forks into the fucking outlets, and you know, there's there's a lot of weirdness when it comes to the styles of that people have mm-hmm. in, in raising their children. What is this uh, this okay. graph you just pulled up? Yeah. So you know, so um, depressive episodes. Yeah. So I guess I'll, I'll just narrate it for people okay. who are listening, not watching yeah. the video. You know, so you said before it's like a virus came mm-hmm. out of nowhere, and that is sort of what it's been like. Um, so what's happening in America, and I know it's happening the same in Britain and Canada. I haven't looked at other other places yet, haven't dug into those stats. Um, what's happening is that rates of depression and anxiety were fairly stable uh, from the you know 90s through the early 2000s. And what you see here, and this is a graph that's in our book, is that the, uh, the percentage of kids age 12 to 17 in America who met the criteria for having a major depressive episode, that is, they're given a symptom checklist with nine symptoms, and if you say yes to five of them, uh, you know, feeling hopeless and couldn't get out of bed, um, if you say yes to five or more, you're, you're considered to have had a major depressive episode. And what you see is that the rate for boys is around 5%. And then uh, around 2011, it starts going up, and now it's around 7%, which is actually a somewhat substantial increase. Uh, but as you can see in the graph, the line for girls starts off higher because girls have more mood disorders, more anxiety and depression. Boys have more antisocial behavior, alcoholism, crime, and violence, but girls turn, it's called an internalizing disorder. Girls basically make themselves miserable. Boys make other people miserable. Uh, the girls' rate is higher, but it was stable from you know, 2000, uh, or at least in that graph, from 2005 through 2010. And then right around 2011, 2012, it starts going up, and it goes way up to the point where it goes up from about 12% to now about 20% of American teenage girls have had a major depressive episode in the last year, one in five. So this is huge. Okay, n- next slide. Uh, Now let's look just at college students. So uh, this is more selective. These are kids who've made it into college. And what we see is that in 2010 and uh, and 2012, when college students were all millennials, the rates were pretty low. This is, do you have a psychological disorder? And they didn't specify. Or they said, such as depression. Uh, And so we see about uh, 2 to 3% of the boys, uh, the the college men, and about 5% to 6% of college women say yes to that question. That's when it was millennials. But beginning in 2013, Gen Z begins arriving. That's kids born in 1995. Uh, Gen Z begins arriving. And so by 2016, colleges are almost all Gen Z, and the rates shoot up, way up. Yeah, we're looking at these charts right now, and folks who are just listening, the it's like it's a like a jump ramp for a BMX racer. Yeah. I mean, it really is crazy for it came women. out of nowhere. And it hits at 2012, it goes on a very sharp upward angle. Right, it goes from six less than six percent to almost fifteen percent in the space of four years. That's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, oh, you can't say that. That's a microphone. Can't say crazy. Can't say crazy. What, what? can I say? Um, Fucking nuts. <laughs> can I say that? <laughs> no, because some people might have a nut allergy. <laughs> ah! So, um, you know. Oh boy, um, ludicrous. But yeah, it's preposterous. How about just frightening? Outrageous. It's really frightening. It's Terrifying. really frightening. Terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. Okay. And so this has huge ramifications. Now let me just make clear. I think we have another another uh, slide there. You bring up the next one. Okay, so um, some people say, uh, oh, come on, you guys are catastrophizing. Uh, the increase isn't real. Mm. Um, it's just that, you know, this generation, they're really comfortable talking about mental illness. Um, and so the fact that they say they're depressed just means they're comfortable. It doesn't mean that there's an epidemic. Okay. I've heard this argument that it's just a, an argument of recognition rather yeah. than of. Perfectly reasonable. That's right. Diagnostic criteria change. Perfectly reasonable argument. Is it true? Well, let's look at behavior. So what this graph shows is the number of boys out of 100,000 um, who are admitted to a hospital every year because they cut, they deliberately harmed themselves to the point where they had to be hospitalized. And what you see here is that um, the, there's no change over time. So boys, these graphs uh, from 2001 to 2015, the lines are flat for all the different age groups. Um, and just notice that the highest rates are around 280 out of 100,000 per year. That's the situation for boys. Next graph. 
bang, the situation for girls is really, really different. So the averages are higher. So self-harm has always been more of a girl thing than a boy thing. Um, vi- you know, boys are Except bi- for suicide. Uh, okay, that's, well, that, exactly. We'll get to that. That's right. That's next. So uh, if we look at self-harm, what you see here is that the rates were fairly stable up until 2009. And then, bang, just same as in the thing. last slate, same thing. The rates for girls go shooting up. So the rate for 15 to 19-year-old girls is up 62% since 2009. Um, now notice the rate for the millennials, that is the rate for the oldest girls, age 20 to 24, that's only up 17%. So whatever happened, it's not affecting the millennials. It's affecting Gen Z. Uh, I think, wait, is there one? Hit the advanced key because I think there's one number missing there. Ah, okay, I'll just, uh, no, go forward. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the number, oh, there it is, there it is. The rate for the youngest girls, check that out. Now, the youngest girls, these are 10 to 14-year-old girls. These are preteens, okay? They didn't used to cut themselves. They used to have very low rates. But bang, beginning in 2010, it shoots up. It's up 189%. It has nearly tripled in the last five or six years. What's the cause? We don't know for sure, but the reason why, so... Because of the huge sex difference, the leading candidate and the timing, look at that timing, is social media. So if you look at what happened in this country and all around the world, um, Facebook opens up to the world in 2006. You, know, you don't have to be a college student, but very few teenagers have a Facebook account in 2006. 2007, the iPhone comes out, but it's very expensive and very few teenagers have one. By 2010, 2011, around half of American teenagers have an iPhone or Samsung. They have a smartphone and they have access to social media in middle school. Because even though for Facebook and Instagram, I think the minimum age is and was 13, you know, I mean, my, my son is 12, a lot of his friends have Instagram, you just lie. So middle school kids are now getting on social media. By 2010, 2011, you've got a lot of them. And that's what I think is the main cause of this because Jesus. social media does not really affect boys very much, but man, does it affect girls. Why is that? So if you look at, so a couple of reasons. First, look at the nature of aggression within the sexes. Boys, bullying is physical. Okay, boys are physically dominating, and then the risk is that they're going to get punched. Okay, so you give everybody an iPhone, what do they do with it? Games and porn. They don't use it to hurt each other. Um, boys, you're boys, saying. Boys, that's right. It doesn't affect their bullying. But girls' aggression, the, girls are actually as aggressive as boys. There's research for, from the 80s and 90s on this. If you include relational aggression, girls don't bully each other by threatening to punch each other in the face. Girls bully each other by damaging the other girl's social relationships, mm. spreading rumors, spreading lies, spreading a doctored photograph, saying bad things, excluding them. It's relational aggression. And so it's always been really hard to be a middle school student. It's always been harder to be a middle school girl than a middle school boy, okay? So beginning around 2010, 2011, we throw in this brand new thing into the mix. Okay, girls, here's this beautiful thing in your hand, and here's all these programs where you can damage anyone's social relationships any time of the day or night with deniability from an anonymous account. Go at it, girls. And so um, the nature of girls' bullying is hypercharged by social media and smartphones. That's Mm. one mechanism. The other two mechanisms um, are the social comparison because it's always been hard to be a, a teen girl emerging with beauty standards and impossible beauty standards. And when we were kids, you had impossible beauty standards that these models were all doctored up and then Photoshop. Okay, so you've got these impossible beauty standards out there. But beginning with social media, and especially in recent years, your own friends can put on a filter on Instagram to make their lips bigger, their skin cleaner, their eyes bigger. So your own friends are more beautiful than they are in real life. You feel uglier. So that's the social comparison of beauty. And then probably the biggest single one um, is the fear of missing out, the fear of being left out. So all kids are subject to this. Everyone's concerned about whether they're included or whether they're, they're uh, excluded. But girls are much more sensitive. And so suddenly when everybody is tracking each other's who was invited, who's there, and especially any program in which a girl puts something out and then waits to see what other people say about it. That is what's really damaging, I think. We, again, let me stress, we don't know for sure. Uh, there are some experiments on this, but it's mostly correlational stuff we're talking about here, correlational data. Um, but the overall experience of being a girl who was born in 1995 or later and got this stuff in middle school is different from being a girl born in 1990, let's say, where you didn't get this stuff till college. Are you concerned that this is a trend that as technology becomes more and more invasive, it, 
and with these new technologies as they emerge, that this is going to be worse? Yes. And worse? Yeah. Yes. But it doesn't have to be. So, so I think in the last two years, we're really waking up to this. Um, the founders of this technology, it's really interesting. So first of all, it's important to note, as many people have read, the, the, a lot of the creators of this technology do not let their kids have it. So they know that these things were made to be addictive. They're made to grab eyeballs and not let go. So um, um, that's one thing. We, all, we should keep that in mind, that the makers of this are wary of it. Second, they've gotten more and more addictive as they've gotten better and better, as they've evolved. Um, so they're getting more and more. And Fortnite is an example of, of a, you know, an extremely addictive game. Um, um, and it does, but uh, so when you, if you've ever been to a, um, um, a casino, and you've seen kids, you've seen people sitting at those machines like zombies, just you know, hour after hour pulling that crank, because there were psychologists working out the variable reinforcement schedule for the gambling companies. Psychologists there helping companies manipulate users, and that's happening to our kids too. They're they're manipulated to stay on the device. So once we're beginning to realize this, uh, the nature of these technologies, the fact that what is good for adults may be terrible for 12-year-olds, 10-year-olds. And once we realize that these things are so attractive that they crowd out all the other healthy activities like playing outside, playing with groups of friends, um, once we realize that, I think and I hope we'll get some reasonable norms. And what I'd like to propose, this is fantastic to be able to talk to so many people, um, what I'd like to propose is if you have kids, especially if you have kids under about 16, Please do what you can to talk with other parents and especially with the principal of any schools you know and say, we need some sensible norms because we can't solve this problem by ourselves. So I want to keep my kids off social media, but my son says, well, most of my friends are, uh, have Instagram accounts. Now, if it was every friend and he was the only one who was excluded, it would be really hard for me to stick to my guns. I would do it, but it'd be really hard. Whereas if it was only a few of his friends and most of them weren't, it would be so easy. And I hear this from parents over and over. I don't want my kid on social media, but I don't want her to be left out. Yeah. And so if the principal would just say, parents, please, this is getting, this is getting out of hand. This is harming kids. Look at the data. Look at the suicide rates. Look at the, look at the self-harm rates. We've got to do something. What do you do? A couple of things. I, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty, a couple of pretty simple norms. One, all devices out of the bedroom by a set time, at least half an hour before bed. There is no reason why kids should have an iPhone or a computer or a screen in their bedroom because so many kids are attracted to it. They'll check their status overnight, and it interrupts their sleep. We can't be having teenagers who have interrupted sleep. That, there's just no benefit from that. Gave my daughter a Fitbit, my 10-year-old, okay. to uh, you know monitor all sorts of different things. She was interested in it, so we got her one for Christmas. And um, she slept five and a half hours the first night she had it on because we could check. We're like, what are you doing? She's checking the Fitbit. What, 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 what's, what's going on here? I'm like, this is not good. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't wear this now. And she's like trying to make all these arguments to keep it. I'm yeah. like, listen. Yeah. She goes, it's not distracting me. I go, if it's not distracting yeah. you, then you shouldn't care if you don't have it on. Right. Because then right. it's not going to mean mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. And then there's like this like, oh, shit, like she got checkmated. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's right. No, because th these things are so attractive. Addictive, so yeah. addictive. Yeah. I had one of those goddamn watches, those Apple watches. Mm -hmm. I had it on for one day. And while I was doing the podcast, it kept vibrating. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm getting text messages on my wrist, yeah. on my wrist. Yeah. So right, and and your brain is all developed. Yeah, you're sort an adult. Of. Well, okay, sketchy. All right. Okay, but imagine if you're a, a ten or eleven year old yeah. kid. Oh, I've and seen you, it. Yeah. and you put something out there, and you want to know, did you know, did Bill like it yet? You know, yes. why did why did Mary like Bill's but not my, like? Yeah. So so that's rule number one. You've got to get devices out of the bedroom. Yeah. Give them an old fashioned alarm clock. Let them wake up with an alarm clock. That's one. Um, two, no social media till high school. There is no reason why kids in middle school or elementary school should have Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, any of those. I agree. They can text each other. Like when we were kids, you'd call each other on the phone. That's fine. They mm -hmm. can text each other. But there should be no social media till high school because it's a, it's a social dilemma it, that we can't solve alone. We can only solve it if there's an agreement among parents and guidance from the principal. Please, parents, don't give your kid an Instagram account. My only concern is that they're not going to learn how to mitigate it or how to navigate it, rather, if, if we say nothing till high school. And then when they so get what? into high school, then they, they're confronted with it. I would like them to have some skills or at least some wait, understanding wait, of what's going on. Now, wait a sec. So, so I'm not saying don't let them have access to these machines. I'm not saying don't let them No, I know exactly it. what you're saying. You're saying, saying don't allow them to have media. social media. Yeah. And how about this? Um, the bullying 
that takes place in middle school is primitive and destructive, uh, and the bullying that takes place in late high school is a lot less and is not really? the same way. Why do you think so, that is? Well, middle, like, middle school kids are just coming into this. Um, there's some research. So Jean Twenge has a book called iGen, and she has some data in there that suggests that when you get social media in college, it doesn't seem to harm you, but when you got it in your preteen years, it does. Mm. And so, and she thinks that it's in part the nature of the bullying is such. Um, so, you know, sure, we want them to know how to deal with this, but, you know, they can learn it pretty quickly when they're 15. It's not like they need a running start from 11 to 15. Right. So I just see no good whatsoever coming from social media in middle school, and I see a lot of harm. If you want your – look, I go around the country. I talk about this. The, almost the rule now is when someone, you know, someone says, oh, well, my daughter's in high school, and, you know, she's had it. And I say, D- how is she doing? Does she have anxiety problems? The answer is almost always yes. Mm. And if it's not her, then her friends are all crippled by or suffering from anxiety. Yeah. So I think we have to, you know, you have to weigh costs and benefits. A few years ago, we didn't know for sure about the costs. Now we do. Yeah, no, you're making total sense. I'm, I'm purely playing devil's advocate, and I'm on the same page with you. I don't give my kids don't have phones, and my ten year old. It's shocking how many girls in her class have phones right. and Facebook accounts and yep. Instagram accounts. And they, I'll, I'll say it right now, her friends are at higher risk than she is of having an anxiety disorder, of being hospitalized because they're going to cut themselves, and ultimately of suicide. Yeah, it's so common, and it's most of the kids in school now. And when they get older than ten, the the number increases. Is like parents hold out for as long as they can, but as they get exactly. older, and the kids want phones, man. Everybody yeah. wants a phone. That's right. So let me put in a plug. So I gave my son. So I'm saying two contradictory things. One is I'm saying we got to let our kids out. Got to start letting them out at least by age eight, at least to go with their friends to playground uh, mm-hmm. stores. We got to start doing this. Um, and at the same time, I'm saying that the, the technology has some negative effects. Okay, if you're going to send your kid out, I totally get what you were saying about your the panic. Like the first time that we let our son out in the park and then he didn't come home right when he said like, and it was real panic. Um, yeah. And part, so two things. One is we have to get used to that because he always does come home. But secondly, I didn't realize this when I gave him an iPhone, my old iPhone. Um, there's a great little product, the, uh, uh, I, I'm not, I don't know if Verizon, no, they don't make it. It's, I think LG makes it, but it's a gizmo or a gizmo gadget. Uh, and so it's a simple, it's a watch, it's a, it's, it's a big clunky thing, but my daughter loves wearing it because it's kind of like a James Bond, Dick Tracy thing. It's a watch, you press a button, you turn it on, you can call three phone numbers, that's it, three phone yeah. numbers. So she can call, and so, so now I can send her out to get bagels on Sunday morning. She walks about six blocks in New York City, it's incredibly safe. How old is she? She is nine. So, Whoa. Yeah. So, um, uh, and she is a much more independent, confident girl because of it, and mm-hmm. she is proud of this fact. Right. That she is a free range kid. She can walk around our neighborhood. I mean, we live in Greenwich Village. It's incredibly safe. Um, so she can go get bagels. And, it, you know, she has no sense of direction. So a couple times when she's been out doing an errand, she gets lost. She just presses a button. Daddy, I don't know where I am. And she's calm. Right. Uh, and I, you know, we talk it through. And I can track her. That's the, the reassuring thing. Wow. I can see on a screen roughly where she is. So I can say, you know, what do you see? And I say, oh, come back this way. And she always knows. If she gets in trouble, just walk home and start again. Yeah. Oof. What are you thinking, Joe? Why, what's what's that facial expression for? Nothing. It's just children wandering around on their own. It's, yeah, it's so... as always happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as they have to do at some point. I know, but listen, look at how you're even reacting to this. Uh, you, what? But you you you're beaming up and you're adding emotion to your voice yeah. and you're smiling yeah. as as oh, it's everything's going to be fine. Everything you're doing this in a, a sort of you're not just reassuring. You're selling it. You're right. I am selling it. Yeah. Because we as a society bought into a set of beliefs that are based on falsehoods. The risk to our kids is minuscule. Mm -hmm. Someone calculated at present rates of abduction by strangers. If you put your kid in a car and you go into a store and you leave the windows open and your kid's sitting there in the parking lot, you'd have to stay in that store for 700,000 years before your kid is likely to be abducted. Well, does not that depend on what neighborhood you live in? I suppose so. Yeah. But still, the point is that there's hardly any actual abduction. And so actually, this brings up a really important point I'd like to say. Um, you, one of the sticking points here is that we're afraid to let our kids out because bad things can happen to us mm-hmm. as well as to the kids. Like, sure. 
And so well, I would hope that would be the least of your concerns. I hope what? your number one concern would be your children's well, safety. Uh, but it, you getting in trouble, I would hope, would be the least of your concerns. Uh, not the least of them, because I am selling something. I am selling the idea that that the the gigantic rise in mental illness of teenagers is caused in part because we've overprotected them. We have denied them the experiences of independence they need to develop their basic social sense. And so I am selling an idea that we've we've totally botched this, and we need to undo it. And a big piece of that is we need to be removed from the fear of legal prosecution. And so Utah, the state of Utah, passed a year and a half ago, a year ago, yeah, they passed the first free-range kids bill, which says, it puts into state law, it says, uh, I forget what the exact terms, but the gist of it is, a parent cannot be considered to be negligent just by having the kids be unsupervised. So if you send your kids out to the park, you know, you have to use judgment. Obviously, if there's a pattern of, mm. a, of neglect, that's a totally different story. Right. But the mere fact, as you just said, the story about, well, I'm teaching my kids to go outside. Mm -hmm. I know that they're outside. I told them to go outside. You can't be arrested for that. Right. And until we have legal protections, it's going to be very hard for anyone to do it because they, you know, the risk is you could be drawn into months and months of supervision. Your kids can actually be taken away from you if you give them independence in some parts of the country. It's interesting that Utah would be so progressive about that. Um, yeah, I don't know the history behind it. It's such a safe place. It's one of the reasons why, I that think. Could be. That could yeah. be. So a big part of this is we don't trust each other anymore. Right. Um, you know, if, if you don't trust your neighbors, then you're, you're not going to let them out. You're not going to let your kids out.